Before Srinivas uh, takes over to call all of you over, my very, very sincere thanks to one and all of you for being with us today. You have no idea what is the kind of encouragement it gives us because when I was given this task of uh, working out on training the trainers program, I was actually at a loss to know what my audience is going to be. So I think safe selling myself, I spread word all over to every nook and corner of the country. I'm sure the audience will pick up over the uh, next few hours. But you all can think that we are the audience for the others. And please give your life and soul because this is going to be put on the website too. And I'm sure people would hear it, those of them who weren't lucky enough to be with you all today. On to you, Srinivas. Good morning, everyone. So let's start our AIOS conference 2022 with a pleasant session in the morning. So it's going to be the first session and I'm so happy that we still have some uh, measurable audience here. Uh, hopefully as the time picks on, we'll have more and more audience. And uh, so here, I think Dr. Chitra has done a wonderful job uh, by crafting a wonderful session that training the trainers. And in case if there are no audience here, but these all will be uploaded in the YouTube again, where most of the trainers, we are going to circulate it to most of the trainers in various medical colleges across India. And uh, that is how that, that, uh, the plan is going to be from the ARC side. So with this, we have our expert panel today, our elite expert panel. We have Dr. Girish Rao, sir. I request you to please uh, come on the, the first row on the expert panel row. And uh, uh, we have Dr. Mahipal Sachdev, who will be coming soon. Dr. Avinash Patange, sir. Yeah, request you to please join. And then we have Dr. Meenakshi S. Yeah. Way. Dr. Sushmita Kaushik, Dr. Saurabh Patwardhan, he is here. Yeah, he's Dr. Saurabh, I request you to please come forward. Dr. Usha Madam is already on her chair. And Dr. Meenu Mathan, uh, one, once he joins, I uh, request the hall coordinators to please guide him on the, the front desk. So, yeah, Shreyas. Shreyas is our co-moderator. I welcome Shreyas also for this session. So, we can start. Yeah, you've called all of them? Yeah. We have Dr. Ashok Grover. Yeah, A.K. Grover, sir, is yet to come. Once yeah. he comes, we'll... Dr. Usha Kim is here. So a very warm welcome to all my co-moderators, Dr. Srinivas, Shreyas, and Tamil for uh, being so committed and involved about this entire program. And uh, without ado, we'll go on to our uh, first speaker, Dr. Avinash Patanje, who needs no introduction, who's the Director of Education from LV Prasad uh, I Institute based at Vishakapatnam. And I think the kind of uh, amazing work he's doing, he's the right person to talk on organizing, managing, and promoting fellowship programs how do I choose my fellowship? So right. on thank you so much. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the chair, moderator, Chitra, for giving this opportunity to Srinivas. And uh, fellowship, right? So it's, it's, it's a formal, the last of the formal educational process. And when someone gets into the educational evolution, we move from MBBS Right, or from 12th standard, let's, let's get back to the history, but from 12th standard, then you move into MBBS, and from MBBS to post-graduation, post-graduation to the fellowship, and that's what I meant, that when someone is aspiring to a fellowship, it's last of the formal training process. And every time you transit from one form of one type of education into the other, you will always have at the crossroads. And when someone arrives at the crossroads, what happens is people ask questions. And asking the right questions is most important. Now, when someone's finished 12th standard and they want to enter MBBS, some of the questions which come is, why you opt for MBBS? Because my father and mother told me that I have to become engineer or a doctor. That's one common way by which we understand and move about. Or my grandfather has been doctor, my grandmother has been doctor, my father has been doctor. And so there's a lineage of doctors, so I opted for medicine. So in terms of understanding, it's more of emotional contact which is predominates over a rational component in many of the time. But it's fair enough, that's not something where we have to be judgmental about it. But if it repeats too often, that this is only an emotional move, moving from one aspect into the next, right? From even after MBBS, if you want to enter into ophthalmology, or even from ophthalmology into a fellowship, keep an emotional component 
to a certain extent, but couple it with a good rational component because emotion is the energy which is required to have emotion, but it should not be completely devoid of a rational component. That's the point what I was trying to make. Crossroads you would reach, but ask the right questions and have the element of rationality in every time you reach at a crossroad. Going to the next slide. Yeah. All right, and uh, let me navigate through this, uh, what I just spoke about in my presentation. So the pivot of my presentation would be circling around the interview process, right? So whether we like it or not, <coughs> it's the interview process. And what we do before the interview, and what we do during the interview, and what we do after the interview, is something which I would like to break up my presentation into for the sake of understanding. And when you hear my presentation, you would also like to understand that for the sake of simplicity, I would be breaking them into rules of two, which I would decipher at the end of my presentation. So rules of two is something which you have to understand for the sake of clarity. So what I mean, honest, what I mean by rules of two, you will be able to gathering uh, you will be able to gather up as and when I start presenting. So before the interview, so what happens before the interview is you have to have two important aspects. You have to understand yourself and you also have to understand the organization where you want to do the fellowship. So when you want to understand yourself, I ask the question, are you readily, are you really want to have a fellowship? Because fellowship does not directly equate or it's not directly proportional to professional success. So we have thousands of ophthalmologists who didn't have a formal fellowship, but still are very successful. Though the caveat here is the definition for success for each of the ophthalmologists can vary. But the what I like to underscore here is fellowship does not not equate directly to professional success. So also lack of fellowship does not equate that you would not ascend in your professional career. So ask the question, what is that blank you want to fill while well, you assume a fellowship? If you find that clarity, then it makes sense. If you not have a clarity, yes, it's an another formal educational process which you try to explore, no harm in it. Nothing to be judgmental about it. And over a period of years, being in an academic institute for over two decades, when you attend so many interviews, right? So this is what I can understand. One example I'd like to sit or I would like to share when we sit with the interviews for the people who like to join, just from the retina point of view, why you chose the retina fellowship. Here it's where I would like to make understand how the emotional connect is so important. The first time I saw the retina in diabetic retinopathy or, in, or with direct ophthalmoscope, I fell in love. And that was the main reason why they chose for fellowship. Do you think if there's a rational component to it? It sounds very much fairy tale or love at first sight, right? And that's the point which again I want to convey. Don't let the subspeciality choose you for as flimsy reasons like what I just gave. But majority of the time you will find such kind of things popping up from the other side when you sit on the interview panel. You choose the subspeciality because of the rationality involved in it. And second, do your research. Have a research done and the best of the research is done by asking the right questions. Make fear of your child and that's extremely important. And also with an understanding that not all fellowship in all institutes are good. There are pluses and minus, again, relative to that person, not to the organization, relative to the person which has to be taken into consideration while you opt for the organization. Now, what are the questions which they have to understand? You have to understand the quality of the program, whether the stipend is available in the program, what is the rigor of the fellowship, right? So is there a bond which is there after fellowship? How close is it to your home? And whether it converges with the long-term goal? And these are the few of the eight questions which can be asked and you can find answers to yourself to get clarity or become self-aware. So having answered those questions, then is you apply for the places which you think has resonated with your thought process. Now prepare your CV and sometimes if there is an opportunity which arise, 
make those important calls, speak to the alumni in that place, understand what is that which that institute which you have chosen got to offer. Here, I would end what we have to do before the interview. Two important, understand yourself and understand the organization. I, I did express eight questions which you can answer so that you will have some sort of ease before you get into the interview process. Now, interview. Again, two important points here. In interview, what happens is you just get five to 10 minutes to impress the people who are going to interview. So you have to be extremely professional and there, and that's the expectations and there's nothing wrong with it. So when you are there in the interview process, so you have to impress and at the same time you have to see the expectations of the person who interviews is they are going to match or see how good you are as in your integrity, intelligence and hard work. Now, dressing up professionally is something which is important. So you can't be casual, like sometimes we get to see in online interviews extremely casual dressing, which does not resonate with the profession in twist of sense. We grew up in certain way, stereotyping, yes, we can't take it away. Second, calm yourself between the interview because you can't fumble a lot when you're in the interview process. And second is, read the basics, but just brush up the latest research. It's not that you have to get into uh, depth of the research, understand everything about it. Just brush up, understand what's conventional, what is current happening in that specialty which you opt for. And during the interview, be very specific and clear. Now here, I, again, I would like to quote, just the way I quote the previous example, I fell in love with the retina the first time I saw. One more stereotypical answer you get to hear in the interview process, why you join, for why you want, is I want to serve the country. I want to serve the poor of the community. I want to serve the institute. All bullshit. It's all bullshit. You know the moment you hear, it's all bullshit. So these stereotypical answers where people are good in ramp walk and giving in, you know, Miss World and Miss Universe will put you down in any way when you give such kind of things. It doesn't work. So be honest. And because it's not only the knowledge, it's what is being tested is the integrity. Because I told you that integrity, intelligence, and hard work is all what is things in the interviewer has in mind when you have right over there. So having spoken about before the interview, what happens during the interview on the two points which resonates well with them. And after the interview, so after the interview also there is small things which you have to be done. Know the institute a little bit better. So when I, what I mean by knowing the institute a little bit better, get an opportunity, go interact with the faculty, the fellows there and the other staff over there so that you get a vibe of what the organization is all about. Here is where I like to take back into memory lane. There's one of the fellow, I'm going back 2002, uh, when one of the fellows had just interviewed, got selected, and I was just at one of the operating room doors, wheeling in a patient inside. So this chap comes inside, and Dr. Das, then our chief, was there, and he was waiting for Dr. Das to come. So I'm talking about 20 years ago. He saw me and says, just ask me one question, Katne ko milta hai? Very universal question, Katne ko milta hai? So I'm not, I'm not belittling his question. I'm just trying to say he made an attempt to understand what's happening in the organization. Till Dr. Das introduced who I was to him, then that was a different revelation. After that, I'm not getting into it. But just to make it a point that this person made it clear that wanted to understand what's happening in the organization and a couple of more questions as well. So. Before I end, I just like to summarize the rule of twos for sake of understanding. Know yourself and know the organization. And during this, during the interview process, two important aspects, the crucial 10 minutes, look like a professional, hear like a professional and speak like a professional. And the people who are going to interview are going to test your integrity, intelligence and hard work in no order of priority. And after the interview, ask yourself, that what you're going to gain from the institute and what you're going to provide to the institute. This is something which I'm going to have intentionally put it at the end because there'll be thousands of fellows who would be traversing the institute. But 
there are few of them who lay their mark for years to come. X, Y, Z was the person in 2004 when he did his fellowship, people will not forget for good reasons. Even for bad reasons, it happens, but for good reasons, try to put your signature there and that makes a lot of difference. So sometimes people are still confused. They don't know what to do. So find your passion and try to follow your passion. Somewhere you'll get to do what is good for you and what is right for you. And still, if you're not, I, I would suggest uh, Ikigai is something which you can try, which I uh, came to know much later in my life. There are four circles which you have to uh, fill it up and, and the, what you're good at, what you're passionate about, whether the world needs it and who's going to pay for it, right? So you try to fill it up. It's a very rational way of understanding your own self. And if you're able to do it, you're, the Ikigai is, suggest that you will have a happy life. But I still contest that because happiness is very internal. You don't have to have all these things for happiness, right? So that's how I would like to end my talk. And thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Avinash, for <coughs> bringing a different perspective to the, the talk which was planned. Uh, the one question I would ask uh, Dr. Girish on this is that, uh, you know, we just like NABH and different protocols have come and have started enhancing the standards of uh, different institutes and uh, smaller hospitals. Would you think that to have a fellowship program, there should be a standard protocol in each of these centers because it would become very tiresome for the fellows to actually find out at their age to discern which is the best of institutes besides the few top institutes which you are all aware of. How could all of them in the audience, some of them who might become future owners of such institutes or smaller setups, to have a uh, replicate the systems? Yeah. So I think what you have raised is a very important point, and it would actually serve the country well if we have a structured fellowship program, maybe through the AIOS or the uh, societies, so that fellowships can be structured across all the institutes so that the, uh, it's easier for the fellows to choose. But right now, most, as Avinash has said, there are institutes which are very well uh, known for particular uh, fellowship programs, and there are institutes which are known for other specialities. But there's no uniform structure. Slowly, there are universities which are taking up these uh, fellowship programs. So in Karnataka, uh, I believe the uh, Bangalore University has a... Uh, fellowship which is given by the uh, university itself. So there is a particular structure which all the organizations within that group follow. So I think it does make sense to have so that there is a uniformity and it becomes much easier for uh, the students also to choose the best program. Probably some of the seniors sitting here, you all should put your minds together and ensure that there is a systematic way. It's not just taking care of your own institutes, but doing for the country at large, then just leaving it to the societies to be doing it because... Uh, can I, I, I agree with your point, sir. In, yeah. in, uh, in Bangalore, it's uh, Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences which have formulated the curriculum. But again, it is left to the institution of uh, how they want to do it and it's basically more of an exam course so that they will get an added uh, kind of uh, certificate in their CV that I have finished from Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences. That's, that's uh, an additional part, that's an, a kind of it. But one thing I would like to ask uh, Dr. Saurabh, uh, as Dr. Uh, Patange sir said, no, uh, in the first time in the interview, whenever the patient or the students presented, they have to be tough, they have to be street smart, all those things, yes, everybody likes it. Who doesn't like an impressive candidate? But going back, there's always a saying which says, first impression might not always be the best impression. So there are certain chances where the student might fumble, the student might go down. But in those cases, how are you going to pick it? Because that might be the student who is going to stay with you for two years or three years and maybe a dedicated and hardworking student stay till two o'clock in the midnight and try to do the things for you or work for the institution. Yeah, I think it's very tough to judge, but I think I'm sure it's only one part of selection process. There must be other exams that uh, every institute takes. Uh, and it's very difficult to judge a person in just five to ten minutes. But you, as he rightly said, with experience, like, uh, you know, uh, the teachers like Dr. Avinash must be getting, you know, out of the students, like wh which one will do better or gain most from the 
you know, uh, in the institute. One more question just I need to ask Dr. Avinash because of his experience, because I feel the generation changes every five years, and he has been in the teaching for long term. Have you seen any change in the, you know, students that present to you for the interviews and the pattern in which the answers, you know, are given? Have you seen any particular change? Uh, I said, but in terms of generation, yes, there has been in a generation, and we have to anticipate that. You can't, one cannot run away with it. So this morning, I think I was just uh, discussing with Sri Priya there and said that when we were studying, everything was so nice. And they will also say when they were there, it was very nice. So that's something which is going to be very evident. No way somebody can escape it. So, and because it, everything happened in the past and we were clear about it. And that's the reason everything was so nice. In future, when things get blurry, it's very difficult to prophesize. But understanding the generation is important to a certain extent. And creating a balance that what is that your organization is going to put forward which will be non-compromisable. The values which you have there, you're not going to compromise on that irrespective of what the generation is going to be like. That's something which is a challenge always to bring to the next generation because the current generation, what is being spoken about, wants to do less work, right? They want to create an impact without being to slog for or hard work for, right? So they want everything at the jiffy. So there's nothing wrong in it because you have one zillion people coming up born like that and then you have to follow them but it's what you have to also make them understand is what is that you would like to be steadfast in your uh, endeavor to make them better right there are differences but much before that just a point which i was to make on the structure right if you make it structure is extremely important because structure gives direction structure also gives sense making there's no doubt about it but if you have an entire structure which is predominant, the chance for innovation starts depleting. So my take on this would be 80% make it structure, 20% make it flexible. 80-20 rule is good enough to give that flexibility so that you have to, you can exercise both, right? So I request you to come up with a curriculum soon, sir. Yes. <laughs> Come up with a structure. I, I, structure. I, can, I can only see. <laughs> the, the, see, the best thing you have to understand when you, hear, when you go to the leadership point of it, right? Don't paint the finest of the strokes. If you paint the finest of the strokes, people will disagree. Just paint the broad strokes, leave it, and they can. They have enough intelligence. If they are coming up to the leadership development program, they can paint the finest strokes. Thank you very much, Dr. Avinash. Uh, we'll be uh, running short of time, so the speakers have to stick to their 10 minutes, and the discussion um, cannot be more than three minutes at the max. Yes. And uh, I would have to just uh, go and come back to you all shortly. Please yes. uh, Thank take you. care. So next and I want the expert panel to be totally involved in the taking, giving, asking questions and answering questions. Too. Thank you. <laughs> so next I will request... Uh, our uh, Chairman, Director, uh, Quality, Arvind Eye Care System, Arvind Eye Hospital, Madurai, Dr. R.D. Ravindran, sir, to please uh, speak on the topic, Training Programs Beyond Fellowship, the Need of the R. This works, sir. Thanks, Dr. Chitra, Srinivas, and all the others for this uh, opportunity to talk on the training programs beyond the fellowship. We heard from Avinash about the mindset someone should have when they join the fellowship program. I will just uh, briefly go through our learning of cataract surgery. You know, I, I've joined Aravind in the year 1982 as a postgraduate. The learning still continues. So we started with intracapsular cataract extraction using cryo and sometimes using a forceps or erisifex. That's how we started. We also started, you know, we also learned the microsurgery at that point. Later, some of us learned how to put an ACI OL. In 86, we were able to learn ECC properly with a Simcoe cannula using a PCI OL. 1991, we were able to learn nine, uh, the manual small incision with PCI OL. In 1992, we had the for fortune of getting a FACO mission and to start the FACO emulsification surgery. And later part of the 90s, we were able to do foldable. During the mean period, we also got used to the CTR, 
and the iris hooks and later on femto i mean this is you know if you take cataract as an as an example the something similar as everybody who is in a different specialty also must have experienced it so the point is it's a life learning process so whoever is finishing a fellowship probably for the next 40 years they may have to keep learning that some somebody must have in their mind today there are some lacuna in the fellowship program one the training protocols may restrict you know what what kind of exposure you get there are institutions which don't teach sics they teach you only ecc and feco there are institutions which may teach you predominantly sics a small number of feco as a result you may not have adequate volume in all the aspects of cataract surgery so that you can minimize the complications or you may lack you know the capacity to manage complications or manage complex cases and again the time period of the fellowship also may be limiting your experience so as a result as you finish your fellowship you have certain difficulties one is you, you know, as you join you probably you have lack the volume to enhance your skill you also will have the problem of adjusting to the new setup equipments all of that earlier you had a support when you had a complication which may not be there as you become a consultant and a professional and the challenges in developing skill to manage complex cases will will be there again the opportunity to learn new cases especially if your private practice is going to be a problem so these are all what you face in the fellowship but there are certain ways you know you can smooth in this transition and continue your learning i'll go with that one by one so one is you if it's one one is a good idea to continue the parent institution some institutes you know offer this opportunity to continue as a fellowship which may again depend on your performance during your fellowship so here you get uh, you know enough time and the volume to become really competent you become competent to manage your complications not only you become effective you know, by minimizing the complication but you also become efficient the time duration you take to complete the surgery and you are able to do all of that in a familiar environment where you did your fellowship but the problem is you may have to stay away from your home if it's not your you know, hometown and you know delay in starting your own long term career also can be an issue and again being in the same institute you are also restricted to learning certain techniques which you may not know if you are in some other institution probably you learn that so that's a, that's the first point second is you also have option of short term training many institutions across the country offer training in small incision feco and also medical retina there are also courses available in lasik they usually takes few months to few weeks to month and there is an ample time to focus on a specific technique and usually these programs have a customized uh, planned uh, training as a fellow you also have to be involved in the patient care so but here this the whole focus will be on training so you will be also be able to follow up on the patients but again the on, on the contrast side there are time involved and again to be away from the practice if you've already gone into the practice again other option is to learn from volunteers you know we have learned a lot from volunteer ophthalmologists i learned my feco by visiting ophthalmologists from canada in the year 1992 93 so some of these are facilitated by some international ngos like orbis and sight life they have each one has got their interest in pediatric ophthalmology and cornea and sometimes you can invite your friends and colleagues who can you know come over and help you in your practice so the advantage is that you get to learn in the home turf and the visiting specialist also can help you to improve your practice and again it's not uh, always easy to get the faculty to come there are a lot of logistics issues getting the patients all could be other challenges and again you know there are also some organizations like sight life also do some skill transfer courses which last for 3 to 5 days and you learn as a group so it, it's uh, so you are focused on a specific skill and learning as a group you know after your fellowship and your competent surgeon also helps you and again in the number of participants are very restricted and it's available only for the select few it's not available for everybody who who are you know the post fellowship period there is another option you can which we have tried during the covid period is tele surgical mentoring with a gopro camera so the surgeon can be operating and somebody can be sitting at home or anywhere even from other hospitals people have mentored our postgraduates during this period 
something this also can be adopted in your practice when you are doing some complex cases if you have somebody to mentor you you can connect with that person he will be able to watch as you are operating and you know with you know with today's technology you can do that without the patient being aware of the whole thing so this really improves your confidence but it's only thing is you need additional infrastructure wifi facility you also have to be a little bit technologically savvy to do this thing and again now we also have the simulator based training we are fortunate to have the help me see simulator for training in a manual small incision it's really good it gives you a real feeling it's like a or four dimensional five dimensional a uh, simulator you really get a real feel of as you are operating on a real patient i am sure some of these things will evolve and you may have it in other specialty as well and this this can be a real one opportunity for you to continue your training and again it's it's an expensive equipment and you lack patient experience but you know a lot of that it also addresses there are also a based feedback on the performance which a probably a regular surgeon may not be able to give and you also have surgical skill transfer programs you know what you have here in aos there are multiple courses are being offered not only here and many other institutions also offer this on and off and that that's an opportunity for somebody to get trained as well and again the last one is observership you know you have observerships available for a short period either in the institutions within our country neighboring countries or also abroad and icvo gives a fellowship with the financial support so all of that you know you'll be able to learn the the new techniques and also able to learn the patient management protocols which will be really useful in your practice the problem is there is no hands on experience there may be a waiting period for approval and you may also need to become a professional member have to pay the you know uh, pass the exam and they also you may have to pay certain amount of fee for this so so after fellowship you know either you may continue in the same institute or join some other institute or you may join a group practice or a private practice but wherever you join you should have the mindset that will enable further training it's you know that mindset is your commitment and compassion to us the patience to give them the best and you know being healthy competition with the peers is another thing enthusiasm for learning new techniques so eagerness to improve skills so all of this this mindset is what really makes you, you know there are so many opportunities are available but if you don't have the mindset it's also good to have a senior surgeon either person who trained in the fellowship or someone else as a mentor who can really you know keep you going you know understand your challenges and train you and again if you have that mindset it's also about you know watching the reading the journals watching the videos attending the webinars these are all freely available you know if you really want to be you know progressive learn and do the best for the patients you probably you should use you know, you know use all these resources which are freely available easily available and you know you can see the multiple times really make yourself better and again you know continuing medical education program which are conducted by ophthalmological societies and institutes you now these all require very minimal time investment and if you are there you also have an opportunity to discuss with all the faculty and uh, and if you have this mindset you know really caring for the patient and really want to improving yourself so that you can give the best for the for the patient is what really will make you learn and there are multiple opportunities available at this point of time thank you thank you sir yeah. uh, for that uh, wonderful talk so i just want to ask you one question when you said continue in the parent institution mm -hmm. after finishing their fellowships mm -hmm. do you recommend them to go abroad once and have a look at the eastern or the western world what practices they are doing mm -hmm. and then come back to the same parent institution and join or you say that okay what's been given here is the best and so what's your take on the a little bit of exposure to the international fellowship as well yeah, it's, it's really important we also make sure that you know some of our doctors who stay on for a long time at least 3 4 years the medical officers we make sure that they go out and see what what happens you know the way you know most mostly to understand the the doctor patient interaction how they really do it the professionalism they are able to bring it, bring there and again you know if you go and watch you know it's like playing a football with a 
with an international team. You go there, you play with them, and then you really understand you are really up to that. So that also gives you a confidence, you know, going there and watching what they do, that to no way they are better than what you are doing. It gives you that confidence, but the, the, the subtle differences they bring in, in the patient interaction, the way they respect the patients, the professionalism they bring is, is something you know we lack today. I think that's what we will definitely learn by that kind of an exchange visit. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Sir, a quick question on uh, this thing. I mean, uh, world over, everyone is aware of the phenomenal numbers that Arvind Eye Care System does, and anyone who stays there will definitely pick up in terms of their technique and skills. But uh, nowadays, ophthalmology is also becoming a very technology-oriented uh, this thing with huge investments. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question was, in Arvind, where there are so many centers across where training is being delivered, how do you balance the cost of investing in uh, the technology in everywhere, uh, in all the branches, versus the skill transfer being given in each of those uh, centers? Like... 3D viewing systems, laser cataracts, so many things which have become very expensive today. Mm. Do you feel that is necessary? Because post-fellowship, that is some experience which surgeons are wanting to uh, get in each subspeciality. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not necessarily Aravind, but for any institution, you know, today we have, you know, there are many multiple chains are all happening. So it will be good to, you know, explore the new technologies and one or two centers to understand that. For example, I'll give you, you know, the Femto laser. We put that up in four centers. We are not very sure. But you know, one of the centers, you know, seeing that it is not really adding value, one of the centers said you know, they don't want the machine, they gave it back. We never also scaled it up. Okay, I mean, in that way, you know, technology is also expensive and it also keeps changing. And it's always, you know, always, you know, you have to be progressive. You have to explore it. And you get it in one institution if it really helps then you know it, it's time to scale it up in other institutions and you know and also train other people in that definitely if it's going to be in a large number then you have to train large number of people and it, it is going to be you know a lot of no, it's not only just doing the surgery but a lot of other inputs goes into that and that means you know then a yeah, select number of people have to handle that kind of a, a equipment and a technology uh dr avinash sir quickly which is involved there as well. And that's the point what you're trying to make, right? Yeah. Now, uh, Dr. Ravindran had put it very beautifully. There is one more point. It's about the value and the outcomes. outcomes. Now, if we don't see a favorable outcome, what you anticipate in mind, and then at the end of it, you say that it's only a diagnostic tool, giving a prettier image than what it used to be before. Technology is good. There is no doubt about it. Whether the technology is good enough for us to create that outcome which is desired, Otherwise, we would be on a peer-based pressure where because someone has bought, we have bought, and then we will not be recognized in the society. And that's a very individual mindset, very conscious mindset. We don't fall for what a peer does or the pressure which the company puts. If you don't have this, you will be looked down upon in the community. And that's individual decision which you have to make. And if you make it, you save money. If you don't, you lose money. Yeah. So the femtos one. There are several examples, at least three, four examples. I know how you know the how we made the decision not to adopt those technologies. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank one you. Uh, quick and last question to panelists here and uh, yourself as well. So uh, before Dr. Sushmita, Madam, uh, takes up the next presentation, we can start loading. I, I um, now we uh, have, I have we have read about the Arvind I K study in the Harvard Business School. Many many case studies have come about Arvind and many other institutions. So we have Shankar Netralaya here, LVP Arvind. After the fellowship, when you send your students for the abroad training or anything, how many of you all really suggest them to take outside fellow, outside ophthalmology programs? Like if they want to do a leadership development program, whether they want to do a business management program. And how uh, do you really suggest them to do it? Because it brings some changes in the, inst in the parent institution if they want to work further. I think that's an important point that you have, but what also is required is the person whom you're suggesting should have the inclination and the drive for. You cannot force things. So as a, from the management point of view, if you try to get someone to do things, it will be done out of force. But if you, if they have the interest, the inclination. That, that's the point, so, sir. How do you develop interest in this? Because majority of them don't want to take up the management positions. 
after the fellowship they say i will just want to do my work hours and go home and relax and enjoy with the family but how do we inculcate in these younger generations to take up certain management roles or management position that's the need of the hour that's the question of the hour now yeah yeah i think it's not very difficult if you it's a reward based system it could be rewards monetarily or it could be rewards in terms of power and recognition within the system so that they move up the hierarchy and once once you show them a clear career path people will opt for uh, even management uh, work besides their clinical work so i think it there is a scope for uh, leadership development abroad not just on clinical but even for managerial uh, yeah yeah so what you say is very important at least 8 to 10 of us have been you know had such uh, leadership training abroad not only abroad but also internally I've been to several courses in mba because we have a firm belief that you know ophthalmology cannot cure blindness ophthalmologists are not going to clear the blind it's only the leadership and the management that is going to take care of the blindness it's not just the knowledge and skill is going to take care of the problem in our country i think you, you have to go beyond the ophthalmology training unless the people are really sensitive to because i didn't want to i really want to talk about it but i was kind of restricted by the topic you have given Yeah. but otherwise you know any fellow having that exposure is very very important yeah. some kind of public health exposure some leadership exposure all of that will change your mindset as to how you look at your practice and where you want to grow you know, because to to develop a vision as for a long term care, career a clarity as to what the problem exists you know what what we want to solve as an ophthalmologist yeah. is very important thank you thank you sir yeah, Quickly, uh, sir. yeah. to get a little bit of more clarity if you have a pyramid where you let me let me rephrase it this way what is seen is sold right in marketing world now having said that if you draw a pyramid at the bottom of the pyramid lies the clinical ophthalmologist right and in between you scale it up lies the academic ophthalmologist where apart from being a clinical ophthalmologist this particular individual has the capability to invest himself or prove himself in education or research or anything or a combination of both or many things and scaling up would be ophthalmology leader right now the question is irrespective of which profession he is how do you know that you have become a leader right understanding the point that it is not about entitlement when someone gets to this you have to be conscious it is just like you 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 have to pick up the race horses and if you're conscious about it you will see this particular individual would try to influence and help people in its in his realm or her realm to make them far better than what they are and you will be able to notice it and if you can and if you're sharp you will be able to pick them up and make them because that's the first step you will see that spontaneously you can see that in them and there where you can make them into far better than what they are in leadership position because they are not for themselves they are much for other people in the community got it thank you just one point i think true leaders need not be in leadership roles also so they can just uh, perform to be a leader but need not hold that designation or the uh, the tag that they are leaders i think uh, it's uh, it's about the person themselves and you can't have everything in one pocket so you need not have all of them to be leaders as well uh, and most uh, most of what dr avinash had to say was around the ikigai model and uh, i think it holds very good for us especially the part where what am i passionate about and what does the world need so if people are aware of these two aspects i think that fills in very well Yeah. one small point can point. i add yes, last sir. one uh, the point which you had said about uh, identifying a person see it's important that you identify who has the uh, willingness and the mindset for all these leadership or fellowship one example i tell you one lady came for interview i was sitting two three people were there and her small child was being ma- managed by her husband outside he used to be brought in on and off and we thought uh, this will not work she is going to be busy with her child and you won't be able but then we took her and then we realized he was the one who stayed till 9 o'clock in the house in the hospital did extended hours of work and stayed back and was a very very uh, committed person so identifying this kind of people will will take a little bit of uh, mm. years of experience of interviewing people and then if we identify properly they'll be big assets to the institution thanks
thank you thank you sir i think uh, we can go on discussing and there's so much we can all learn from the expert panel but in the interest of time uh, i think dr grover sir is not uh, here so we'll move on to madam uh, dr sushmita kaushik who's uh, professor at one of the leading institutes in the country from pgi chandigarh and we look forward to hearing from her about opportunity opportunity beyond boundaries Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you at the outset, Dr. Chitra and the ARC, for the opportunity. Can I have the slides on, please? Yeah, for the opportunity to speak. Um, at the outset, I would say that uh, I'm not sure whether I'm even qualified enough to talk about this because my passion is do the best you can where you are. So um, I, I'd like you to keep this in context. Uh, uh, as the talk goes on. So the first question is why go? You know, you've become an ophthalmologist. It's time you probably have a small child, you have a small family, and if you're a woman, you're also a new daughter-in-law, so you want to prove yourself in all aspects, isn't it? So the two things that I see is, one is observerships and fellowships, that's one, to educate yourself, do a little more than what you're doing. And the other is, of course, that I'm doing pretty much what I want, but let me go see the world. Let me avoid being a frog in the well and think that you know my space is the pinnacle. And there are some quote unquote who would go for a better life. I don't like these pothole roads. I don't like the light going. I don't like all that. And there might be some crazy people who just want to adventure out into the new world and do something which is different. So where is this possible? Um, traditionally, observerships or fellowships, which are academic, are, these are the places where most postgraduates would look for, the UK, US, Australia, where they would want to train themselves a little more in whatever they want to do. But there's also an, a, a different sort of niche, which is the work experience. And you could go to any of these countries, but the the ones which are not explored so much are Africa and the Middle East and China, which actually offer work experience in another setup. And they all, I think, um, work to enhance your outlook and to broaden your vision. So it's, it's not a bad idea to just go and work in another setup to just get perspectives of what else they're doing. So we'll go on to the academic ones first. Now, these are all structured training fellowships. If you'd go on the website or wherever you want to go, most of them would have rigorous qualifying exams for licensing because, unfortunately, they want to be sure that you are a safe ophthalmologist to be let loose into their communities. And the fellowship would usually require some amount of time which is spent working in the country once you pass the licensing requirements. So you need to work for some time before you, so for instance, as an SHO or maybe as just a registrar somewhere in, in Australia, if you're going before you're actually allowed to even enroll for a fellowship. So these would, would vary, so I, I'm not going into the details, but they would vary from institutes, from states, from countries, and we need to look into that. But then you also have an opportunity to be an observer or an apprentice. There's no clinical work. It's more like job shadowing. And most hospitals abroad would allow that, depending upon your CV. And it helps if, when you go abroad, you latch on to someone who you think you would like to work with and talk to them. And they're usually quite all right about it. Um, they usually shadow a particular person or a particular department. And according to institutional rules, some may be paid, which doesn't mean paid to you, but it means that you might have to pay for a, for a fellowship or observership. And uh, you are officially permitted to attend clinics. You will be given this, this eye card, which will allow you to walk through the corridors and make you feel a little important for some days. You could walk into the ORs, and you can also attend academic activities. So it's a nice overall you know, experience to have for a few weeks or a few months to just see the world and see how things are outside. And believe me, it will broaden your vision than what you were doing just here. And you may be permitted to examine the patient yourself once they think that you're okay. But remember always, this is the different ball game, what Dr. Ravindra was also saying. Remember, you have to introduce yourself to the patient. You have to ask permission before examining. So that's, that's something new which you would learn. 
and you would see that you know imagine being asked permission here the patient is asking permission will you please see me and here i have to ask permission may i see you so it's a, it's a it's a different ball game so um, australia is a little different so i just put that in um, the pathways are a short term and a long term so you have a specialist pathway which is really long but which makes you really settle into australia if you really want to do that but then you have specialty clinical fellowships where you are a senior registrar or an unaccredited registrar jobs in general ophthalmology those are reasonably better to have and it's a sort of stepping stone towards taking the ransco exams if you really are interested in settling down in that country so that's one little thing which you don't see in the in the us or the uk so coming to the ico fellowships these are important but um, you need to go on to the ico website and really search for them as of today this is what is available so i put this in so you have multiple 3 month fellowships which are offered by ico and its supporters and you'll get a list every year of what fellowships are offered and then this year you have a 3 month and a 6 month fellowship for the diagnosis and treatment of retinoblastoma but you also have a 3 month fellowship specifically in pathology oncology and microbiology which is a basic science thing for this you don't need a clinical licensing so that's one if you're interested in that you don't need a clinical licensing to be able to take this even in the in participating centers in the US or the UK There are some long-term fellowships. The ones on offer this year are the uh, Helmrich Fellowship and the Fred Hallows Fellowship, which are one-year subspecialty fellowships, and you can go into what is required for that. Some of them are paid as well. Um, the next uh, bit is the work experience. So, in the Middle East, to be a consultant, you either need a foreign degree. or you need a dm and mch plus 5 years experience in your parent country without that they don't even consider a specialist or a consultant position and a rec recruitment is advertised and specifics are detailed as time goes by so for just an example for the uae once if you fulfill the eligibility for a license they have something called a pro metric exam which is an mcq online exam and once you clear it you can enter the dha registry and then apply for job so you first need to fulfill the eligibility for the licensing and then take the exam and then once you have once you've registered yourself you can apply an interesting bit which most of us don't explore is africa so these are the four countries uganda ghana egypt and nigeria which accept indian ophthalmologists they are all underserved and you have an opportunity for comprehensive ophthalmology as well as surgical work so it can be an exciting thing to go into an unexplored continent really and see what is possible there um you could go to singapore but they require an frcs or american board qualified for practicing so that that's one step if you're willing to clear you can apply in the far east china you could scan for opportunities with or without the covid there's no special exam but it's based upon the interview and experience and the advertisements keep coming out so that's another possibility um the next thing is uh, mission attachment of volunteer work so organizations recruit for volunteer work in underserved areas so this could be another adventure excitement of ophthalmology if you're interested in you have things like the orbis the unite for sight fred hallows mission So this is just a summary this is uh, available in a wonderful IGO article uh, which uh, details this out so i've just put that in but it's step wise where to go and what are the exams to clear if you really want to train and get a get a structured fellowship abroad so choose and do your homework but in the end uh, my gray hair will talk plant your own garden decorate your own soul instead of waiting for someone to bring you the flowers and that's why indian ophthalmology is where indian ophthalmology is and the second is that the grass isn't always greener on the other side it's greener where you water it so just with these thoughts thank you very much it's been a pleasure a great talk madam uh, uh, should these uh, short term work opportunities uh, should be inculcated in our fellowship curriculum should we look Like I, I I don't think it can be uh, inculcated in the curriculum because it's such an individual decision. I mean, it's it's up to you. Can't say that it's mandatory for you to go abroad because then your fellow might ask you who's going to pay for it. So um, 
it can be offered as uh, as opportunities which are available if you want to take and i think what we can incorporate in our fellowship program is give them a study leave if somebody would like to go for four to six weeks i think we can incorporate that as a study leave but uh, they'll ha it'll have to be very clear but as part of the mandate of the curriculum i don't think we can include a foreign stint um, abroad that's what i think thank you madam that was a wonderful talk yeah. one one point i would like to add is in the curriculum, I think the most important which we are lacking either in the medical education, postgraduate education or the fellowship education is about the professionalism. Yes. That has become the topic and uh, the Western uh, people are following it as a subject in their undergraduate itself. Mm -hmm. Because most of the time we make them good surgeons, good clinical competent surgeons, but understanding the, the excellence, the humanism, the altruism, the accountability, the good understanding of ethics, I think that chapter, I think, needs to be introduced and that will add a little bit more to make it an entire, uh, uh, fit it into the framework. Yeah, so if, I if I could just fit, uh, add in something which I believe is that the other thing we lack is standardization. And standardization into the ophthalmologist that has come out. I mean, if at the end of this talk, if there's one thing, why is it that everybody wants an FRCS or an FRC oft or an American board qualified? Because if somebody is American board qualified, the rest of the world can take it that he knows this much. You know, he's done this. As an MS ophthalmologist, I have no idea. And I mean, being politically incorrect, even from my own institution, there are some MS ophthalmologists who I wouldn't go and get my blood pressure checked from, but they are MS ophthalmologists. So I think professionalism and all that is fine, but what we really need is absolute standardizations of the postgraduate curriculum so that if you have done an MS ophthalmology, people mm -hmm. can close their eyes and recruit you. That is not possible. That's why we have to go around all this. Yeah. If, will she bring her baby in? Will she stay? Will she get pregnant? Will she? Are I mean, if you're, you know, that, that's what I believe. That, that <laughs> Thank you, madam. <laughs> uh, yeah. We have our uh, expert panelist, Dr. Meenakshi, madam. Welcome, madam. Thank uh, you. Yeah. I Hello. first apologize for... Uh, hi, yeah, you missed. Thank you. Yeah, I apologize. I come from a small town called uh, Chennai, and I didn't uh, find, I found the Mumbai uh, traffic daunting, and I somehow got and here. And you come to the more smaller town yeah. like Mumbai? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Uh, and thank you. I'm also from PGI, uh, and I speak from the perspective of PGI Chandigarh. It's my MS from PGI Chandigarh, and yes, I barely knew how to uh, measure the blood pressure when I finished. For no uh, fault of PGI, probably I was just a naughty PG who never uh, studied. But uh, I speak from the perspective of someone who went to the U.S., did all parts of USMLE, did a residency uh, research fellowship, did a uh, fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology, came back to Shankar Netralia, and... Uh, precisely try to bring the standardization to our residency program. I know Dr. Grover has worked very hard in this area uh, of bringing standardization. And what you said, Srinivas, is absolutely true. So why, people ask me, why did you go do a residency again? What was the need? So things like professionalism, communication skills, which are not really covered, and accountability, accountability. From, from, the, from the teachers as well. And uh, because there you don't even have to pass the boards to start practicing. If you, are, if you are board eligible, because that is how closely the residency training is scrutinized. Mm. So you don't have to pass any exams to actually start practicing. So I, I feel that is something very important we have to learn from them. It was, it's an enriching experience. I was able to uh, you know, uh, put some of it into practice in uh, Shankaranitralia. Long way to go. I also wanted to add, in addition to ICO, from last year, we have this body called Ophthalmology Foundation Education Consortium, OFEC. And some of us are uh, on the advisory panel. Basically what it is, it's a big group that of educators who split away from ICO and have formed the OFEC, and the whole focus is on education. And they have come up with uh, uh, fellowships, just like the ICO fellowships. They also have uh, uh, very good modules for teachers that are ongoing. I happen to do one on communication and professionalism with two other uh, ophthalmologists from different other parts. But this is a wonderful, wonderful resource, all for free, with questions, uh, curriculum, videos, uh, extra reading, and, uh, and uh, assignments to give you a certificate covering the entire gamut of uh, ophthalmology educator. 
for the ophthalmology educator. OFEC, something to uh, check out. Very, very Thank nicely you. put out, madam. Thank you. Thank you very much. You covered it all in a <laughs> in few sentences. Thank you, Sushmita, madam, for that wonderful talk. Maybe we should have some kind of sponsorships for these very brilliant students to go abroad if they really have to go for that some bit of extra learning. I agree. I agree. That question was already asked, so I thought I'll cover this. We'll, we'll start the sponsorship program. Anyway, you've I, already I, started a newer curriculum, no? So let's look the, forward. The first, to we'll start with our mentor, Dr. Chitra Ramurthy from I Foundation. We'll start the mentorship uh, sponsorship program. Yes, Dr. Ardia. Yeah. So we shall now go on to our uh, next speaker, Dr. Vivek Dave, a very dynamic, um, handsome young ophthalmologist from uh, LV Prasad, Hyderabad. And um, I'm rather proud to share that uh, I really got to know him well when I, my daughter joined the institute and he became a mentor. When I realized how much mentors matter to a student in an organization, and he, I felt, would be the best person to tell us how it enhances the training program. On to you, Dr. Vivek. Thank you, Dr. Chitra, and uh, it was nice knowing that I am handsome. <laughs> All right. So uh, thank you, ARC, for uh, having me here. Uh, I'll be speaking with you on uh, mentorship, how it enhances uh, the training program. I have no financial disclosures. I represent the Anand Bajaj Retina Institute at the LV Prasada Institute, Hyderabad. So uh, why am I speaking with you today? So in my short uh, teaching career, uh, I have taught many. But uh, when it comes to mentorship, uh, I'm happy to say that I have mentored three residents, six retina fellows as LVPI faculty. And in my current role uh, as the APAO leadership uh, development program uh, committee member, I'm currently mentoring six ophthalmologists across uh, Abu Dhabi, Brunei, Nepal, China, Singapore, and uh, Hong Kong. So I have learned a few tricks of the trade uh, along my journey. So let's start with the story. All of us like stories. So we have Professor A and we have Student B. So Professor A likes uh, the enthusiasm, the aptitude, and uh, the approach to work in Student B. Student B admires the engaging teaching style of uh, Professor A. Both tend to have brief conversations. Uh, it builds up uh, to longer discussions. Student B raises uh, many questions about uh, career choices, work habits, interpersonal relationships with peers, and also institute politics. And uh, Professor A welcomes all those discussion and uh, gives her two cents uh, on each of those things. Over the next few years, you have a personal email, telephonic exchanges, both on professional as well as uh, the personal front. There are research collaborations that develop between the two. Professor A gets uh, academically promoted. Student B graduates with flying colors. And a family-like bond keeps developing. More years later, they are still in regular contact. The personal and emotional bonding possibly is now at a higher level than just professional. Student B is now a professor. Using this past experience, Student B now guides his students, still takes intermittent inputs from Professor A while guiding his students. So what have we gone through so far? Both Professor A and Student B have lived a mentorship cycle. They are satisfied in knowing that their influence and experience extends down to the next generation. So one small example of how a mentorship cycle would run. Uh, for those who get time uh, during their flights back home, uh, I would suggest reading The Seasons of a Man's Life by Daniel Levinson, where I found a very apt definition for mentorship, that it's a two-way relationship and a type of human development in which one individual invests personal knowledge, energy, and time in order to help another individual grow, develop, and improve to become the best and the most successful that they can be. If we look at uh, the current curriculums in most of our training programs uh, anywhere across the country, you would have these different elements. Each place would either satisfy all of these or maybe deficient at uh, one or two, especially the last two. So there is definitely theory. There is hands-on uh, depending upon uh, you know, institute to institute. Again, research depending upon institute to institute. 
education is definitely there administration uh, well our courses are still not at a level where there is a regular administrative exposure that our trainees get uh, along their tenure so when all of these elements are there why do we specifically require mentorship that i feel is because though the current curriculums and the approaches that we have do tell trainees what to do when to do how to do but where possibly we consistently lack is how best to do it and what more can a trainee do with respect to a given task with respect to his or her understanding of that task so if we have this mentor mentee relationship what is in it for the mentee well the mentee would get encouraged and empowered in personal development uh, the mentor would help uh, them in identifying and achieving their career goals identify gaps in generic skill and knowledge increase their confidence and also the mentee in a way has an access to a senior role model and then as we saw in the story the whole cycle would repeat when one day the mentee becomes a mentor so what's in it for a mentor so there is a continuous academic and personal stimulation most of us in our profession many a times days become run of the mill so when you have someone who is like you know a raw person given to you and you have this opportunity to sculpt that person you have this continuous stimulation you have a satisfaction of having positively influenced a colleague it's an enhanced a level of self esteem and stature among your peers and also we should not discount that just because it's a senior colleague the person would not come in and throw a curve ball at us or throw some fresh ideas so you will always have exposure to novel ideas and opportunities when you face trainees so we've all had teachers so is there a difference a teacher and a mentor mentorship possibly involves most of the same skill set but beyond teaching a mentor would invest in a mentee's professional and personal development it's like for the mentor it's a transition from a thought process of i will teach you as much as you want to i will empower you as much as i can so subtle play of words but possibly the entire meaning to which uh, the extent to which a mentor reaches out changes for the mentee it becomes a transition from just gaining knowledge to gaining wisdom and experience so what traits do you look in for for a mentor if you satisfy all these points i think it's a bull's eye but most of our mentors would be a combination of all of these uh, at different levels so master of the craft a champion of your cause a co-pilot in most of your endeavors a sheet anchor for the times when you are down or for the times when you are facing difficulties and a reverse mentor a person who is also open to taking in your ideas and your thoughts so are there different types of mentoring models yes and most ideally a mentorship model can be a combination of all these three so one of them is called the coaching approach where you impart specific knowledge or aid in achieving a goal second is a role model where you demonstrate how to be how to conduct by personal uh, sort of conduct of your role and collaborative which is a mutual goal of development so an ideal mentee mentor collaboration would be a combination of all these now when you are in this role or when you are in this relationship though there is no sacrosanct way of behaving or conducting yourself there could be some fine do's and do nots for a mentee as well as for a mentor so for a mentor what is important is to be available for the mentee respect the mentee ask questions track the progress or the lack of it have a constant gauge of what are the strengths and weaknesses and give a constant feedback what a mentor should not do which sometimes is a fine line is promote your agenda through your mentee use them as quote and quote free labor take credit for anything positive that comes out and also don't finally end up making a clone of yourself so you are there to basically help that person grow not really make another of yourself for the mentee what's important is punctuality a good follow through with the mentor keep a track of the agenda which are being discussed accept critique 
accept challenges and show appreciation for all the time and effort that the mentor is putting in. Some don'ts would be to avoid very objective decisions, very high level decisions without interacting with your mentor. Rely exclusively on the mentor. Mentor is there to facilitate. Mentor is not there to absolutely dictate which way you should conduct yourself. Do not accept everything on face value. Everything that the mentor tells you may not necessarily be what is the way ahead. So always be open to discussion and do not over idealize. So is there a measured documented impact of all that we have spoken right now? So there's a lot of literature out there which does show that there is a lot of impact on trainees. I would allude to this one article on mentoring in academic medicine, which is a systemic review in JAMA, which says mentorship was reported to have an important influence on personal development, career guidance, choice and research productivity, including publications and grant access for all trainees. Are there mentorship pitfalls? Yes, there could be a pitfall if there is a lack of plan, improper training of motivation, if there's lack of time, too much expectation, making the program mandatory, or a lack of mentee follow through. So these are some points which we should be careful of in a mentee mentor program. In conclusion, mentorship is a boon if the system can sustain. It is also a two way dance. Mentoring has been defined as also a brain to pick, an ear to listen, and a push to make through. So I would finally end uh, with photographs of two of my mentors who have shaped my career. And I'm sure most or all in this audience would have an opportunity to shape uh, further minds uh, in their careers. Uh, thank you so much for the patient listening. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Vivek very apt presentation and you told it in a story which made it look more beautiful and more thank you. attentive. Thank you very much. I, I think I agree with his points that the mentor has the role model in him who tries to you know, try to practice, develop, mentor, motivate, uh, all, all those things which are... But one thing I would like to ask you, a fellow who does extremely well in the fellowship exams, he gets selected. So during three months of the time, then his effectiveness starts coming down. So do you have any evaluation system you would like to do it after every quarterly uh, kind of thing so that make him sure that he has to be updated each and every time. Otherwise, sometimes some fellows try to become a liability. So how do you prevent them going in becoming the liability for the institution and for your patients? Right, I think that's an important question. I'll try to answer it uh, in a very short time. Uh, one way is the objective way that we all do. Most places uh, have uh, serial or regular assessment uh, modules where you assess them objectively with respect to their performance. Whereas uh, I feel what is important is that may go on on one track, but many a times there may be certain other emotional issues, family related issues, certain other adjustment issues. So what I think is always important is you should have an informal chat while the objective assessment carries on, best things might come out over a cup of coffee. Take the trainee with you and try and find out uh, you know, what's going on. Are there specific hindrances that the person is not able to come out with? And many a times you realize it may be something very trivial, which when adjusted or you know, put right back on course, suddenly changes the entire trajectory of uh, the trainee's performance. Yeah, I'd like to add something about mentoring at the residence level, the postgraduate level. Uh, often it is confused with the uh, mentor being the thesis guide or vice versa. Now that is not at all an ideal situation because sometimes there are, there are uh, the thesis guide and the student are, 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 are loggerheads. So you need to have somebody to go to uh, who will be able to listen to your side of the story. So I think it's very important that you have mentors who are a different, a different set from uh, you know, the guides or even the HOD, that's one. The second is the stakeholders have to have a buy-in into the mentorship program, otherwise it's going to fail because I know we tried it a few times at SN. The, uh, because you, mentoring needs time, as you correctly pointed out. And sometimes it is looked at, when, when you're counting patient numbers and surgical numbers, the time spent on mentoring is uh, uh, you know, looked at time that's wasted. Uh, it should not be looked at time wasted by the uh, the people who call the shots. 
So it, there has to be a buy-in. Everybody should be on the same page. The head of the institute, the director of education, all have to be uh, uh, all have to recognize mentoring is important. It needs to be given credit. Uh, it needs to be given time. Mentors need training. You are not a born mentor. Some people are, but very often we are not born mentors. So there are excellent mentorship training models, and so it's good to handpick a bunch of mentors by informal feedback from the students, whom they feel they can reach out to easily. You pick those and then train them to be mentors, and then your mentorship program will be successful. And I think the best way also is that the mentorship continues over the lifetime of that particular student so that the mentors take the responsibility of being connected with them. Thanks a lot, Dr. Vivek. That was an amazing talk you gave. We shall now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Giri Shivara, who is a... <coughs> um, heads the uh, Shankar Netralia administrative section and also a senior consultant of the Vitria Retina Services. And he's going to be talking on some very challenging talk. How do you structure your CME programs with an objective? On to you. A difficult talk. Let's see how you're going to do it. So it, it is said that when you speak, yeah. you only speak what you know. But when you listen, you actually get to learn new ideas. And I am thankful to ARC and Dr. Chitra for making me a part of this session where I could listen to a lot of uh, innovative ideas from the speakers. I agree that this CM is difficult. As a retina specialist, eating a CM is not that difficult for me. So I had to uh, scratch my brains trying to look at material for coming out on structuring this talk and this would be the scope of this talk. So this National Academy of Medicine defines continuous learning health system as one in which science, informatics and culture are aligned for continuous improvement and innovation with the best practices seamlessly embedded in the care process and more importantly patients and families active participants in all elements. I think that's one important factor that we tend to overlook, and so that all this new knowledge is captured as an integral byproduct of care. So we need to understand that whatever we do in our activities, in conferences, CMEs, ultimately, we want to make it deliverable as a best care for the patients, improving the patient uh, experiences. Now in a healthcare organization, we all need to look at the triple aim of an organization, and that's basically to improve the population health, effectively use the available healthcare resources and ultimately give patient the right experience while taking care of their health. So as uh, Avinash said, medical education typically has four years of undergrad training followed by two to three years of residency, followed by fellowships in some cases, and then you could even have super specializations. What is very important during these is the importance of hospital rounds. So now most of the present day uh, institutes probably do not have this, more so post COVID where ophthalmology is now moved to a daycare. So most of these now tend to be only outpatient uh, uh, care kind of uh, situation, but one cannot underplay the importance of hospital rounds that have helped in mentoring and teaching all the uh, postgraduates and undergraduates journals, meetings, and conferences. So this has been what conventionally has been the teaching modules. But the fallacy is this, we as doctors, we believe that we accurately can assess what our learning needs are, or in other words, where we are lacking. We do not look at data to understand what is the prevailing practice pattern within the organization or within the society or within the area where we want to have this program. There is no objective way of analyzing the performance of the uh, target audience. One of the major drawbacks of di didactic lectures are it's one way. And a person comes, delivers his lectures and it's just assumed that the audience is receptive and has imbibed everything that has been spoken. And ultimately, at the end of the session, we get credit hours or countings uh, of points, which can help us in our uh, uh, program. So ultimately, what we should be looking at is, like what Dr. Ravindran said, that we have to look at innovating 
education. So look at ways in which you can make it more interactive, make it more easily accessible to people. It need not be a physical, in-person kind of training. It could even be through podcasts, videos, simulation-based centers, or even as in COVID times, we have learned very well that even online education is an excellent platform for dissemination of information. So there are ways of innovating so that the same deliverables are given at all times. Now, here comes in the role of a professional within an organization who would be mentoring this CMA program. And it's very important for that per professional or that person to know what are the gaps in that particular organization or that cohort of uh, people who are going to be the beneficiaries of a CME and have uh, theory and evidence grounded educational activities which are tailored to the context culture and which is very specific to that particular health enterprise or that particular group. And that's where this model of uh, plan, do, study, and uh, act comes in play. So as I said, data is very important here. And uh, unfortunately, in India, we do lack, because there is no national data of uh, health. Each, uh, each of us have our own electronic medical records where we can look at our own needs, but there is no way uh, an All India Ophthalmic Society or a Veterinary Society can actually access the data of all the uh, members and try and find out what are the deficiencies, which are the areas which require uh, more uh, uh, an approach. So uh, once you analyze the data, then you can actually look at what are the deficiencies, look at the ways in which you can overcome these through tailor-made programs, which could be short courses or, or a series of uh, uh, training programs. And then you also end up having measures so that whatever has been intended to deliver can be in form of measures. Again, the data is very important here. Which then brings us to how do you choose a theme for a, uh, a CMA program? So it could be anything. It could be a new theory. So something like in ophthalmology, uh, in retina, we have suddenly come out with pachychoroid uh, spectrum of diseases which is conventionally different from what we were initially thought. So this is a new theory, and you could have a CME just looking at that particular spectrum of uh, condition which purports a new theory. It could be a new drug, uh, an, a new intravitreal injection, or a new glaucoma drug, or a new uh, dry eye drug, which is very innovative, has a different mechanism of action. So that could be a CME which is tailor-made just for that particular uh, activity. It could be a new investigational tool, like a OCT angiography, or uh, one of the uh, corneal topographers, or a uh, IOL measuring technique. So you could have many uh, tailor-made CMEs for a particular investigative process. It could be a new surgical concept itself, like if you have something like the uh, scleral fixated IOLs, or um, complex surgeries for a uh, uh, a persistent macular hole, where people have now started doing a retinal grafting. So these are all very specific uh, CME programs which are tailor-made for that particular activity itself. Research, India is lacking this. There are institutes which are trying to make a difference, but again, one way of uh, motivating people to take up research could be through targeted CMEs on this activity itself. Ex and obviously for the uh, Postgraduates, you could have uh, exam-oriented uh, CMEs itself. So ultimately, what you need to know is what's your target audience. So as I said, when you are looking at resident programs, you are looking at subjects which are more basic, which are more targeted toward either to en enhancing their knowledge or their approach to exams. Private practitioners, I, I would hesitate to have a CME on FLAX the femtest assisted it for a general practitioner. Whereas uh, for institutional practice, it's more tailor-made to whatever new technology that's going to come into the system. Or it could be a subspecialty kind of program which looks at that particular uh, cohort of uh, practitioners. Like you could have uh, people looking at intravitreal injections, uh, the, the latest, which would be of interest to a retina specialist and for some of the uh, 
medical retina specialists. Of late also interdisciplinary uh, CMEs are taking importance. So we know that while we're treating patients with diabetic retinopathy, there is an interplay with a physician. Or if you're looking at ocular oncology, you also have the uh, radiologists and the oncologists coming into picture. So interdisciplinary CMEs which are focused at a particular thing. Ultimately, what needs to be uh, looked at is how do we move away from just assessing the uh, impact of a CME purely based on credit points. What would be probably important is to look at pre and post CME assessment of the knowledge and not just look at commitment to change but actually measure that change uh, either in the processes or in the outcomes and I think for this it's very important that there should be mechanism of monitoring the uh, patient outcomes on a national level. So ultimately, one should understand that CME is a lever for improvement rather than viewing it solely as a means to help physicians meet their licensing or credential requirements. And it helps to tackle complex problems and translate evidence, the what and the how into clinical practice. That is how to do the how. Ultimately and most importantly, it holds great promise for improving patient and the population care. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Girish. That was a very difficult uh, uh, talk, but the challenge continues to remain. Like today, I had structured a, a very nice program, but I'm challenged with the audience. And I think if you have a full hall, the amount of energy a speaker has to convey to the audience is entirely different uh, if the hall is. So I, I think there are a whole lot of limiting factors, inability to get leave from the place of work, the cost of travel, the cost of accommodation, I don't know, whole range of things put in. So I think uh, maybe CMEs at a local levels, like uh, uh, city levels or state levels, if they are structured very well, would have a better reach for the local audience exactly. than probably something like uh, this. which uh, And that's happening to an extent. So most of the, uh, yeah. especially in ophthalmology, you have now yeah. uh, programs, happening. programs which are right yeah. city-based itself. Yeah. So... But some of these programs are actually, it is my disappointment about many of these programs. Uh, people send their topics forward and those topics are put together and assembled and uh, in, a, in a very short, brief manner it's put together. So the idea was that how, how we take up a program and how do we structure it and as you beautifully said, it has to be based on the location, based on the need and based on the newness of the uh, topic, but I think CMEs have to be taken a lot, lot more seriously and uh, done justice to. I'm sure Dr. people like Dr. Grover and Dr. Minu and Dr. Saurabh and Dr. Praveen would and Dr. Shreya would do a great job. But we have all those great organizers here. I wanted many more in the audience who would learn and go. This did yeah. not happen today. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Do you have you. anything I, to ask him? Uh, no. Uh, Dr. Minu, would you want to ask him something before you go on to the next speaker? I, I won't consider it as a hindrance, that is the less attendance. Yeah. Because thanks to post-COVID era, huh. that it has taught us how to record these sessions and yeah. send them individually, <laughs> mail them, yes. blast them. Yes. And we I think that, that kind of reading is more because it comes in your library. Yeah. Because sometimes we might listen and we might forget. But getting it up in your laptop and keeping it and storing it, I think that's one thing which COVID has taught us and we are definitely going to do that from ARC. Thank you, sir. Yeah, because listening to the whole program may not be interesting to many people. Yes. So they are space people are specific now. Yeah. So they can have this in their uh, uh, laptop, wherever, and whatever, and accessible at any point of time. Yes. And so this is not a loss, madam. Don't yes. think that uh, people yes. won't listen to this. Many yes. hits will come later yes. on yes. and uh, it will be well we have, taken. We have no, no, I wanted, of I wanted post. the best for my speakers. Stop. That is true. That <laughs> is true. But that is again another point. See, yeah. now we have also learned over two years to look at a blank screen and talk. <laughs> yeah. So that is not at all so a big deal. A but then in a hall, when you're sitting in a hall, this is a very valid point that uh, yeah. you'll be looking at empty It's chairs. like a news anchor, sir. You don't know how many people are actually watching it. But thousands and lakhs of people I really think that the whole world is looking at you. <laughs> what is the problem? Exactly. Next. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think we that shall now go on to our next very uh, dynamic speaker, past president, a uh, phenomenal surgeon who just doesn't do cataract. He does oculoplasty. He does refractive, and he jack is, uh, of all trades. No master of all. <laughs> uh, so we look forward to hearing from you. But I think I have a talk in the other hall. I would miss it, and I would hear it later. 
thank you very much thank you arc thank thank you chitra this is a wonderful concept training beyond post graduation is a lifelong process and i know i think one of the most best part of knowing uh, best part of learning is knowing what you don't know and and to try and narrow down the gap which is of course never achievable to a sufficient extent but you have to keep trying so one of those is of course the qualifications or the certificates or the no post nominals that you get so we'll talk about that many other things having already been covered so the ones that are really most popular or available in the country include the fellowships of the royal colleges not showing yet so we will be talking about the fellowships of the royal colleges we'll briefly talk about the ico examination and the post nominal that it gives you and we'll talk about the fellowship of the collegium of the all india ophthalmological society or the fico it's not coming here yani aa raha hai signal whether the target audience is there we people who we want to i mean if if it's just the faculty or is are there people who are here to learn and that is also equally important Dr. Chitra, I have a very quick question before you leave. Yeah. So, uh, in many other meetings yeah. uh, globally, the education sessions are a part of the main meeting. They are not on the pre-conference day. Yes. That way, the number of days you skip work and come yeah. uh, is reduces. Is that something yeah. that uh, ARC will think about um, in the future? ARC is a poor citizen in uh, AOS. so that is the problem no you got to bulldoze your way into the yeah. main program and that's the yeah. only way educators yeah. can come we should have extra the halls there and so that people will choose and go i think we don't have to have an hall de dedicated but you could yeah. definitely have the sessions yeah. built yeah but, but, but the problem is madam this? there are around uh, 18 halls on the main yeah. session the crowd gets distributed no people arrive but having right? a more focused one day program or one day workshops personally i feel is much better than i think there are more than 20, no, actually, 22 halls no actually people need not attend all five days if a genuinely interested person could attend the first three days or the last yeah. two days or but the but if he comes on a one day then definitely he will have no i agree with your point of view too i've done but i've been part of this program for no, 10 years this is what i'm saying no incidentally the other hall i am going there because there are no chairs for people to sit so i think i would uh, next time ensure that i have 6 minute talk and i fill the hall with 50 top people to talk so they become each other's audience <laughs> i don't know that's the only way sorry dr grover i'll come back so i think we have to be interesting enough we have to be good enough to attract the audience <laughs> you that, <laughs> that we start with dr grover mere duplicate bhi dal do kar dijiye i think i'll talk like this so the royal college examinations essentially are uh, the frc oft which is now available in this country which and the FRCS Glasgow and the FRCS Edinburgh and uh, the advantage of FRC of London is that it allows you to mainstream into the UK training program the UK training program is a 7 years program and the FRC of has been specifically designed with that specialist training uh, program in the UK and you are is uh, supposed to go through the different stages of the examination according to the number of years that you've sent in spent in the training program so you have uh, in the frc oft 
uh, you have the first of all a part one examination which is a mcq examination in two parts of 90 questions mcqs each which is supposed to be given after about two years of your training in the uh, residency program and that is supposed to cover the diagnostic investigation techniques and the clinical part as well so you're not uh, supposed to be good enough to do it before two years by the end of two years you should approximately do that program and you progress further into the third year after that the next stage you know, this is something totally different this is oculoplastics how did we get there I can't see anything here, so I can't change it. I'll present without this. So the, um, that's the uh, initial part one, and, and thereafter... Top arrow pe jai hai usko. Yahan pe display nahi hai, so I have to work blindly. Go back for on that arrow, if you can, uh, the first arrow on top. Mm. Yes, please. We are all technically challenged people. <laughs> So, this, the FRC of the examination now available in India offers the advantage of uh, your, if you complete FRC of, you don't just have a PLAB exemption, you have the possibility of getting FRC of which integrates into the UK training program. So, the, uh, after you cleared your part one, you have the option of appearing either in the refraction certificate examination or the part two. Not this talk, this is not the talk. So, display I work, then I can do something about it. Not after how they've been treated, you won't want to feel royal. Okay, so, yeah, thank you, great. So the uh, reasons why people take these exams, either FRC OFT or um, your ICO exam or FICO, one of the reasons is you want to uh, an international validation by an exam which will be accepted when you travel beyond your borders. And if you particularly specifically for these FRC of the our FRC uh, S exams if you want to train in the UK. Now, um, the Glasgow and Edinburgh exam only give you a GMC exemption when you complete an FRCS, but no entry to specialist training. And we, as we already said, the FRC OFT does. The main objective of these examinations is to find out if the person who's appearing in the exam is able to work independently in a safe and professional manner. So this is the crux of what they want, that they, this is a safe practitioner. Every single time that is what is stressed. So they look specifically for those things which can make you an unsafe practitioner. So we have already spoken about ophthalmic specialist training in UK which is a seven years of PG training leaning, leading to a certificate of complete training and culminates in the fellowship of the college. Now, um, part one, as we said, is to be completed by year two, which is 90 questions, two papers on basic aspects, including clinical sciences, basic sciences. Refraction certificate is totally a clinical exam, nine different stations, subjective and objective refraction. They would like you to do retinoscopy on models and now or on patients when the full exam is possible, non-COVID time. And part two is written and part two is orals. 
these two are to be completed before you complete your seven years in training. Part two written as 180 MCQs with your full, these are essentially exit exams, which kind of certify that you have now done enough to qualify for safe practice in the UK or elsewhere in the world. So part two orals is combined, constituted by Viva and an clinical OSCE, clinical cases based OSCE. For overseas candidates, there are no eligibility restrictions, but these exams are recommended at least after four years in clinical training. So orals again are structured with the, uh, these five stations and a six station totally on communication skills. And one station is attitudes, ethics and responsibilities. One station is audit, research and evidence-based practice, health promotion and disease prevention, besides patient investigation and patient management. So there is a lot of uh, emphasis on professionalism as uh, Srinivas said. Now in the uh, part two, you have the division into different subspecialities based on real patients and videos taken as short cases, but everything done in a very objective manner, all responses are predetermined so, and the same question, same set of questions are asked uh, of all the examinees, making sure that they're not mixing with each other. We've already spoken about the order of examination, part one, then either refraction certificate or the part two written, whatever you want to. But you should have passed all these three before you appear in FRC of the oral examination. So now the oral examination is available in several other countries, India, Trinidad, Tobago, Egypt, Singapore, and Malaysia. We organized the first exam at Vision Eye Center in February. The second one will be at Shankar Netrale, and third one will be at Arvinda Hospital. Every six months, they'll be holding one so that each center will alternate with either refraction certificate or with the oral examination. The FRCS Glasgow is again, the format is somewhat similar, but somewhat different again. Three parts, each part must be passed before proceeding to the next one. And in future, all written examinations of FRCS also, like FRC OFT, will be available online. So now you can appear in all these exams and anywhere in the world uh, if you have a center where the practical part is held. So part one was basic sciences, again MCQs. Part two was earlier two parts. One was a problem solving paper and second was MCQ. With effect from October 21, it will be only an MCQ of 180 questions. So that part about problem solving is gone from Glasgow. And now they also have made an MRCS ophthalmology Glasgow with effect from June 2021. And part three uh, is after you've completed the other two, it has a structured oral or viva component and a clinical examination component. Three 20 minutes vivas of different parts. The important thing is that the structure is that uh, uh, it's quite an objective one. You again have uh, defined questions, defined answers to be sought from the candidates. Two ca examiners sit together, mark independently. While one is asking for the first 10 minutes, the other one is only observing and noting down the points about the responses. And uh, when the after 10 minutes, it will shift to the other examiner asking and the on other one only listening. And both mark independently. And whenever you give a fail mark, you have to give a justification, the reasons for it. And uh, very often your marks are quite similar based on all the guidelines that they give, give you. There are plenty of guidelines. I'm probably one of the, those who's done the maximum number, probably 31 exams of FRCS Glasgow now. So doesn't make you any better, but <laughs> that's the thing. Okay, then part three, uh, also has the clinical examination, which is an examination where uh, you are speaking as you examine. There are, again, uh, two examiners, and uh, they'll, be, um, they'll be, again, asking for six minutes each if this is a 12-minute thing, and you may cover two or three or four cases in the mind meanwhile. 
depending on how well you answer and you will be marked based on that. At Edinburgh examination, there was a partnership with ICO earlier for the MCQ part, which has now broken down after all those revolutionary changes that have taken place in ICO with splitting of the education fellowship and all that. So now there is going to be a new MRCS ophthalmology online examination by the college this year. Uh, de details are awaited. Claire, who was earlier organizing the ICO exams as the head, is now advising them and doing it for them. So the part C is the one which is the final one where there is a written um, paper of MCQs and structured orals and structured clinical OSCE again. The ICO exams, we all, is the most popular exam. We are the country with the second largest can number of candidates in the world after Egypt. And uh, started in 1995, only worldwide specialty exam being held in any specialty. Um, and uh, the, again, it's a confirmation of your uh, ability and you get exemption for some of the exams, FRCS, etc. if you've done certain parts. And this has a basic science examination which covers visual sciences and optics and a clinical science examination, part C, and an advanced examination. This was also 115 questions or 180 questions depending on whether you wanted to apply for FRC Edinburgh, so other, that's why they had to make two, one, 115 questions and 180 questions. So these are the essential exam. There was a subspecialty examination which I had forced upon them when I was subspecialty committee head. It was not making money, so the new revolutionary ICO has removed that exam from because yeah. they are more concerned with whether we make money per exam or not. So. <laughs> Visual sciences examination is, covers all the basic sciences and the advanced examination entitles you to the acronym or degree or FAICO. So the eligibility is defined in ICO examinations and FICO acronym is then given but besides passing examination uh, of the advanced examination should have a recognized local face to face. Another two minutes? Okay, so FICO examination is the one that uh, I am in charge of as the president of Collegium at present, and I am. I can say with surety that I read a few blogs and I totally agree with students that it's not a standardized exam. It's not a very well structured examination. So uh, we are doing something about that. The subspecialties that are covered are known to you. Eight subspecialties with cornea, contact lens, external disease with refractive surgery being the ninth option. So these are the new subjects. We have changed it from this year. Th these will be the subjects now. And we made all of them, including comprehensive ophthalmology, as one and a half years now. We, are, we have prepared guidelines, which we prepared five years ago. We have revised them so that we hope it was done with a con as a consensus document involving all the major institutions of the country. And we hoped to start the um, accreditation, which we now hope to do once we have these revised guidelines, a 350-page document compromised by this group and now comprehensively revised, being released here. And we hope to start accreditation of subspecialty program with all the guidelines that have been prepared to standardize fellowship training at the post-doctoral le level throughout the country to help achieve standardization, which Srinivas was talking about, in subspecialty training, as well as to create subspecialties with appropriate exp expertise. So we have defined the content of curriculum, and we have defined the guidelines for the entire programs. And for the FICO examination, we have the MCQ and the clinical examination component. AIS, as you know, has been a pioneer in subspecialty examinations. We were the ones who started it first with an online exam, and then we gave it to ICO and other countries also, some of them started after that. But uh, the FICO multiple choice questions needed a lot of change, so what we have done is we have uh, involved the erstwhile ICO examination team. That team came out 
led by Nicola Quilter and her uh, examination uh, education experts and her subject experts. So we have engaged them on behalf of AIUS. We have already done um, um, signed an MM memorandum of understanding with them on behalf of the Collegium. So we'll now make sure all the process of standardization, validation, standard setting for results and uh, uh, including uh, m ensuring that each question is linked to a certain part of the curriculum which we will now put on the uh, website of ICO in which which now includes the suggested reading material suggested minimum procedures that a um, fellow should do it includes the minimum facilities that should exist in an institution which does it and the time sequence the facilities for fellows the facilities for faculty and everything has been defined so we hope that this exam will become a gold standard for subspecialty examination worldwide. And we will also totally review the clinical examination to make it more relevant and more uh, um, appropriate and standardized. Let's hope uh, it works out well. Thank you very much. Sorry for taking this extra. Thank you, sir, for a great overview of all the options available. One quick question. Uh, how one can decide one examination over the other? How one could decide? Um, it will essentially depend on one's choice and what you are interested in. If you are going to settle abroad, probably you would want to do an FRCS or an FRC OFT. If your choice is UK, FRC OFT, certainly. If your choice is Singapore or getting additional re remuneration, if you go to Middle East, then an FRCS is... is uh, uh, quite good for staying in India for staying in India it just adds that confidence to you <laughs> that you have an international okay. um, something otherwise nothing is uh, okay sir thank you so much uh, we have our next speaker Dr. Praveen Krishna who will be presenting on making an effective presentation and enhancing their podium presence so before he starts up uh, Ashok sir Grover sir I just want to have one question with the panelists uh, as well so when you are taking your fellows and you get to know that they are appearing for FRC of the MRC of how much percentage of it matters while selecting the criteria for the fellowship? Dr. Avinash. In terms of selection of fellowship? For, for, for the selection of the fellowship, you get to know that the, the person has passed a FRCS part two. Now he's applying for part three or he's doing MRC off. He has passed it recently. Yes. How much of that will actually matters? Because in India, as Grover sir said, it adds up to the CV. But in Western world, that's the licensing exams. So in India, since it's not the licensing exam and it's more of a, an added degree and it brings you brushes, your, makes you a more perfect person. So how who will says? you consider it while doing who an says, institution? Who says it's going to make a perfect person? Not a perfect, but at least it adds up to your CV. That's no, what Dr. Grover said. It's, it's another decorated certificate on the wall. It's all about a degree is if it's not attached to a purpose, right? I'm being a little bit honest about it. So if for an individual, if you have to practice, the competence is what, what is required. Skill set comes next. And these certification are, you know, as the first block or the first step towards it. But at the end, you can have a fantastic certificate hung on your wall, and if you're not competent in skill, everything falls flat, right? So, but answering to your question, uh, would it be an important factor for someone to be selected for a fellowship program? May or may not. Uh, one, 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 uh, one thing which happened during my this thing is, patient came to my place and there was just a glass for solution. She insisted on seeing the chief uh, was sitting outside on the other uh, hall. I said, what, you just have need a glass and go. No, 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 I want to see specialists. There, see, it is written there, FRCS glass. So I want to go there, FRCS glass. <laughs> so it may, may add value like that also in India, you know. <laughs> <laughs> true, true, true. Yes, quickly from PGI and uh, the Girish. No, uh, it, it doesn't really make a difference to our selection of the candidate, whether... I wish we had a say in the selection of candidates. <laughs> a lot of them would not make it. But yeah, having said that, uh, if somebody has it, it would probably, in my mind, to be honest, give some level of standardization to that person more than pata nahi kya kya hoga MS So that's all. Yeah. But ultimately, you know, talking to them and uh, getting yeah. them in would be. Yeah. yeah. So
Because there have been situations where we have taken a DO candidate over an MS. Correct. Right. That is true. Very true. So we have a last speaker, uh, Dr. Praveen sir, who will be presenting on making an effective presentation and announcing the podium presence. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Joshi and the ARC committee. Uh, well, uh, if you uh, were looking at the slide that I put up, this only is to signify, or obviously I'm bringing up the end of the queue for the presentations, and it is always difficult to do that because you have finite time, you potentially do not have a lot of time for discussion as well. Uh, but I'd like to start with a very small video Today, that I'll give you the link of. We're uh, introducing. You'll probably recognize three this video. A lot of you have probably seen products it. Revolutionary products of this class. So this is a video I'm not going to play completely. The first this is one. The uh, launch of the first iPhone, and it is, is one a widescreen iPod with touch controls. Videos. The second is a revolutionary mobile phone. And the third is a breakthrough internet communications device. So, three things a widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. An iPod, a phone, <laughs> and an internet communicator. An iPod, <laughs> a phone. <laughs> Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. So you get the idea. So the idea there is not to be showing all your cards right in the beginning, but actually to build up something for the real reveal. And that is one of the iconic presentations that everybody credits for uh, increasing the sales of the iPhone. So very quickly, what I'll go through today in the next uh, eight minutes or so is to talk about what is important before you start to make a presentation. What is it that you do to prepare for your presentation? A little bit about slide design. How do you deliver your talk? And a few things that I think I've learned along the way. This, in fact, is a one-hour presentation that's been condensed into eight minutes. So I will actually uh, move quickly because of the fact that it's probably being recorded. Before you start, what is probably important is trying to pick the right topic as well. And these are topics that are actually picked from the scientific program of a recent conference. And this is a session on cross-linking. And if for anyone who's looking through this session, you look at the topics and nothing really stands out or looks interesting enough for you to uh, attend. Now, if you compare that with what you should do when you are actually choosing a topic, is you actually should beat around the bush. And you should avoid the main topic and pick something that is going to bring an interest in an attendee who's looking through the scientific abstract book to say that they should attend this. For example, if you look at this session, there are a couple of topics that actually look interesting. Say, for example, why certain modifications in cross-linking won't work, or what we still don't know. Now, these are topics that will evoke interest versus DALC in difficult situations or DALC step by step. And so when you pick a topic and somebody is looking at why you should go to that hall, it is important to actually position your topic either as a question or a promise of delivering something that is different and not a topic that you've already heard maybe at least 10 times in the past. The other important thing is, like all of you are doing right now, it's important that you should uh, prepare to cater to your audience because the audience is always evaluating you just like you're doing right now. Uh, and it is important to also understand that you will be catering to a diverse group and you can't position your talk only at one level and you have to start low and go high or vice versa. The other interesting thing that is something that I've learned the hard way is if there is one slide that you have to remember from a presentation, I would say that this is it. That every presentation actually is a story. Everything that you will remember from anything that you read or you see a video or a photograph is the story that goes along with it. 
the same thing goes with the presentation. You will not remember numbers, you will not remember references, but you will remember the story or the gist of the presentation. So make every presentation into a story. But before you start your story, think about what is it that you want to deliver and what is that one take home point that you want your audience to carry home with you. And like you saw Steve Jobs, ensure that you don't reveal everything right in the beginning, but start to build it up slowly so that the anticipation in people who are listening to you is continues to rise throughout the presentation as well. But again, the second most important point that I'd like to leave you with after this presentation is try and keep everything simple. If you speak jargon that is very complex, that only shows that you are very talented or something that you're very special, uh, this is not going to really gel with your audience because they won't remember that. They'll remember probably your great talk that I didn't understand much about. So it's important to make sure that you transfer some of your knowledge to the audience that is actually listening to you. For students, how long does it take to actually make a good presentation? It is estimated that it takes about um, 90 hours to make a good presentation that you can actually deliver and that will be remembered. Now what about designing your presentation? Designing a presentation is not about the colors that you put on your slide, but it is designing the presentation to be effective. And it's not about what kind of uh, background or what kind of uh, mode that you use like PowerPoint or Keynote, but actually about the story itself, about the beginning, the body, and the end. And a very quick summary of how to design a presentation is something like this, especially for ophthalmology or medical sciences. One is figure out why are you talking, uh, talking about the topic and what is the question that you're trying to answer. Then talk a little bit about what is known about this. This is your introduction part of your presentation. Summarize the literature very, very quickly and not more than one or two slides. Then talk about what is unknown. And once you do that, then talk about what is the previous work that you've done in the field, because this actually is going to engage your audience. Talk about your results. Then always try and give a case example, because this is something that will be remembered if it is tied to a case example. If you have a couple of slides of diagnostics or histopathology or something about basic science, throw that in because that again proves or shows the uh, audience that you're a little smart and you have access to all of these things as well. Bring everything together right in the end and then theorize what is it that you're trying to tell everybody. And once you do that, you summarize your presentation all over again so that you get a quick gist in 30 seconds or less. And once you do that, always conclude well so that, again, your presentation is, does have something to take home. What about themes in your presentation? Always try and have one single theme throughout your presentation. You can pick whatever theme you want. For example, if you're doing a, a talk on dry eyes, you could pick a theme that includes water and pictures about water just to actually make the connect. Slide design, again, is a really long topic that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. J again, just keep it simple. Remember the 157 rule, which is very, very popular. One picture on each slide, five rows of text, and not more than seven rows, seven letters in each row of text to make sure that this, again, doesn't look cluttered. The ideal slide is not to have a lot of text. The ideal slide is to have a picture that will gather attention and to have one point that you want to deliver or your audience to actually capture because that is what you want them to remember. Not a lot of text, including crutch words that you're using during a presentation as well. About the kind of slide background, most auditoriums now, like this one, are usually well lit. And that light usually tends to go onto the screen as well. So most auditoriums using dark backgrounds doesn't work really well nowadays. It's better to use a lighter background because the lights do not reflect as much on a lighter background compared to a dark background. Having said that, if you want to showcase surgical videos, it's better to use a dark background because they usually stand out better on a dark background than the illuminated white background in the periphery. Try and convert most of your data into charts and do not talk about numbers or showcase too many numbers. If you are showing pictures, again, remember that the picture doesn't really look good. If you have a lot of light surrounding it or you have very odd colors surrounding it, it's better to actually have the picture surrounded by a color that is part of the picture, like light gray right here. But the best way in which you can showcase a picture is to have the picture cover your entire slide and point out one area of interest that you want the audience to look at because that is exactly what you want to convey. 
when you're delivering your talk, again, it's important to have some sort of animation to bring attention, like this kind of a slide, if you're talking about keratoconus or the algorithm for working on keratoconus, as you talk through it, you bring in a little animation and then you also link your talk to what you're speaking about so that again, attention is garnered rather than show the whole slide at once and talk through it because you do not know where the audience is going to focus. When you're delivering again, five quick points, always make sure that you're telling the truth. Do not try to theorize too much. Get to the point really quickly and highlight what is important. And probably the most important point of my presentation is the fact that keep it really simple. Again, know your stage, come in early to the hall, make sure you know what you're going to be speaking about, check your laptop, make sure your connections are fine so that you don't actually have any glitches later on. Invest time in reading because this is what is going to come through when you're talking in your presentation. If you don't read well enough, it will show when you actually speak because you will not be able to connect your slides from one to the other. We spoke about dressing appropriately. This is important as well because you only have about five to 10 minutes to actually impress your audience. Hopefully they're looking at your slides and not at you, but occasionally when you're answering questions, they might look at you, so you might as well look uh, presentable. Be slow, do not uh, speak very rapidly. This is again very basic, but also a few things that I've learned that are important is when somebody gives you a suggestion or your panelist or the audience is talking to you about something that might be divergent from what you're saying, Always be curious and accept that as something that you'd like to explore for the next time. Make sure that you sleep well the previous night because that again will ensure that you're well rested and prepared for your talk. Couple of interesting things, don't eat a heavy meal before you sleep, not because of the fact that you feel sleepy, but because if you're speaking close to the mic and say if you burp, that doesn't sound very good. Don't have too much soda before you speak as well and this is unfortunate occurrences that have happened in the past. Again, drink a little bit of water to make sure you can get through a 10 minute presentation, not too much that you have to leave it in the middle. Always stick to time to make sure that you also respect the speakers who will follow you after you. Apparently five to six rounds of practice is really good to ensure that you deliver your presentation consistently and smoothly without too many breaks. And like Dr. Grover showed, you probably don't need slides to make your presentation. You know your slides well enough that you have a technical glitch you can still get through your presentation as well. Again, be yourself, don't bring on an accent, don't do things that you think actually will look better on stage, just be as honest and be as much as you as a person because that is what the audience is looking for. Again, when you're speaking, don't look at your screen, look up and connect with the audience because that is again is something that will ensure that the audience stays connected to you rather than always look at the screen during the presentation. Again, evaluate your audience, change your presentation if it needs to be toned down or up a little bit during the presentation to make sure that you connect very well. And also put in a little bit of personal touch. If you have individual photos that you have, put in some of those because and refer to them because that again will bring in a connect for your audience to you as well. Important, start strong and end really strong. But again, the last slide and the most important slide is try and keep it as simple as possible because what you're trying to do is not to impress someone with the work you've done, but to teach someone with what they can take back to deliver to their mentors in the future. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Praveen, sir. I think he spoke the truth because he's, he used the word, speak the truth. And he was the first, one of the first few speakers to be in the hall to make sure uh, that, uh, the, to know about the hall. I, I really appreciate your point, uh, Praveen, sir. But emphasis a little bit upon the videos to be added in the presentation. Sometimes you have, yeah, sometimes you have a very theoretical presentations. So how to make it more interesting? You need to add animated videos or how, how videos should be important in your presentations? I think the reason why I didn't speak about the videos is because, again, it's very diverse for the kind of specialty that you're speaking about. There's some specialty like neuro-ophthalmology that you'll have none. And some so should like we say, create an animation for that? Uh, for the videos, it is nice to just let them run by themselves and speak through them or talk about the video as it is running, not let it run in the background if you say something else because then the audience won't know what yeah. to actually focus on. Exactly. Uh, animation, I think earlier as a young speaker, I used to put in a lot of animation I thought looked cool, but I think now I try to minimize it as much as possible and just show what is going on rather than showcase keynote or one of those things. I think minimize animation 
and good quality videos again as large as the screen as possible so that again you are not worried about the background that is disturbing your video fantastic right. thank you thank you so much sir any last comment from the expert panel or we can end this session as we have crossed 8 minutes past 12:30 so ravindran san has given a thumbs up so here we are thank you so much uh, audience for uh, being here all the time from 10:30 to 12:30 looking forward with more interactions from you all in the coming 5 days thank you very much and i thank my co moderator dr tamil uh, thank you <laughs>